Hi, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about uh, master, sorry, medical device files. So MDFs, medical device files that are required under ISO 1345 Clause 4.2.3. Um, the reason why I'm doing this now instead of way back in 2016 when uh, it first came out is because the FDA required a device master record under 21 CFR 820, and the Europeans required a technical file. So we focused on trying to meet the technical file requirements and using the exact same format for the FDA's DMR. But now that the FDA is incorporating ISO 1345 by reference, they've actually stated it in the preamble that they're not going to define a device master record. There won't be one anymore. Um, and they're not going to create a definition for a medical device file. They feel that ISO 1345 has enough detail already in there. So how are they going to do this? Well, they said there's enough info already in 1345. So where do you go for formatting content of what's supposed to be in your technical file or medical device file? And that's easy. It actually predates the European regulations. We're going way, way back, like 2000. Uh, eight, I think, is what the actual date is. So the Global Harmonization Task Force, which is now disbanded, created a bunch of documents, and that was the basis for all the regulations that they created on uh, what would be required in a medical device submission. And one of those items um, is a GHTF guidance document that's available on the IMDRF, I hate all these acronyms. I'll put them down below, I promise, in the in the description. So I'll put in MDF, I'll put in uh, DMR, I'll put in technical file, I'll put in uh, a link for the GHTF guidance documents and IMDRF. But IMDRF is the International Medical Device Regulators Forum, and on there they're hosting the now obsolete GHTF guidance documents. But that's all you've got. And that's actually what I use to create our technical file template as well. So I reference both documents in the same template. So if you already have our technical file procedure, uh, SYS25, you're good. Now, if you're going to comply with both the US and Europe, what you're going to want to do is specify in your procedure that you follow the GHTF guidance document for FDA and you follow the CE marking requirements for CE marking, but you use the same template as an index to show people where the documents are found. And I have each line, I say where the reference is in both. So the GHTF guidance document, and I'll put the link down below for this, it's GHTF SG1. So SG1 stands for the study group. It's the first study group. N011, so that's the uh, record. And then the date, the revision date of it is 2008. And that correlates with the CE marking regulation for what should be in a technical file, so Annex 2 uh, of the MDR. <clears throat> so each line item of that tells you what should be in there. So um, if you're interested in getting a copy of it, you can, on Monday, buy our Procedure on Medical Device files, and we're going to be doing a webinar on that as well. So if you want to actually attend the live webinar, buy it now. Um, uh, I'll put the link down below so you can click on it and buy it if that's what you're interested in. But if you've already bought our technical file procedure, it's very similar. We're, we're actually creating that from the technical file procedure, and we're just taking out the requirements for C marking. Why are we creating two different documents when I recommend only having one and using one for both? Because some customers only need to do business in the U.S., so since we sell procedures for domestic use only for medical device companies that only work in the U.S., they might only want something that doesn't have any information about CE marking in it. So that's why we're creating the medical device file procedure, but it's going to be very close to what's required in the CE marking procedure, just none of the CE marking references. So uh, clinical evaluation requirement, not there, or a clinical evaluation report isn't required for the U.S., so that won't be in there. But other things will be, like you're going to have essential requirements for safety and performance. That will be there. Um, we don't normally fill out um, an essential requirements checklist for the FDA, but if they're going to require a medical device file, that's the best way to demonstrate you comply with all the requirements in the standard so or in the, in the guidance. So um, 
that's why we're doing it that way. But now I'm going to cover step by step what's in there. So the first section is a device description. So product specifications, variants, accessories, those kinds of things. That's when you that's what's in your first section of the medical device file. And what we've done for that is we have a template for a device description, and we've made sure it corresponds to all the requirements in the GHDF guidance, all the requirements in the C marking one, and all the requirements in the FDA's guidance on what should be in a 510K device description. So no matter which one you're doing, the device description, that one device description meets all the requirements. And in the index, you just say it can be found in this section of it. So this document, this section, this document, this section, or you could say what page it's on. The next uh, requirement here on the list, I think I just rolled past one. Okay, the next requirement is information provided by the manufacturer. So there is a great um, guidance document for this, a new standard. It was published in 2021, I think. Um, it's ISO um, 20417. And that guidance document tells you how what should be in an instruction for use. But the title of the guidance is um, information provided by the manufacturer. So the, the old, um, I think it was um, 980, EN 980, is now obsolete. They're using this instead. But this is for global. So if you're writing instruction for use, that's the best practice on what should be in there. And they also have requirements for labeling. So if you're using that plus the ISO 15223 guidance on symbols, you should be all set in terms of what should be in the information. Now, of course, there are some FDA specific things in 801 and 830, but you, you should be all set with 99% of what you need just by following that standard in the symbol standard. So that's what you're going to put in the information provided by the manufacturer. It's going to be Here's where our IFU is. Here's where our labeling is. You're going to reference those documents. So this is just a big index saying the first one's just you can find that on this page of the device description. And the next one's you can find that on this page of the instruction for use or this page of the labeling. Okay, the next section of your um, master file um, or, yeah, the de medical device file that you're going to be using is general safety and performance requirements. So this is straight from the GHTF guidance document on um, safety and performance requirements. And there isn't really an equivalent out there except for the C marking one. There is a TGA one that, that's specific to Australia. There's one for Canada. But th this is what we would expect you to fill in. And normally people do it in a checklist format. Um, and Canada and Australia will both allow you to use ones created for other countries, as long as you also add on, maybe at the end, here are the ones that we specifically need for our country, or how, you, how do you address the differences? Um, the next section of it is benefit risk analysis and risk management. So the FDA is not going to be looking at this ma uh, medical device file during a 510K. They want a 510K submission. They're going to look at this medical device file during their on-site inspections, and they're going to look very closely at 14971, and that's a big change for the FDA inspection. They've said we're going to be looking at 14971 risk management files. We expect companies to up their game there, and so you're going to be providing them a complete risk management file, which includes a benefit risk analysis. Now, it says in the standard, if your risks are acceptable, you don't have to do the benefit risk analysis. Europe says you do have to do it no matter what. <coughs> so you got to decide which way you're going to go. But de novos, PMAs, they all have benefit risk analysis. So in general, I recommend, and that's the way our procedure is written, to do a benefit risk analysis no matter what. But you need to be aware of that difference and decide what makes sense for your product, depending on what markets you're going to be submitting to and what the regulatory pathway is. The next section is going to be your product verification and validation. So this is all your VNV testing reports. So you're going to list each report um, in this in this index. And so you'll, as you update testing reports, you'll update the revision of that test report. Um, the next section here um, is technical documentation on post market surveillance. So this is specific to that new Annex Three requirement in the um, MDR. The FDA ha is incorporating ISO 1345 by reference, so there will be a requirement for post-market surveillance. However, 
there is not a requirement for submitting post-market data unless you have a uh, PMA device. That, so you have like a 522 plan, something like that. Normally, class one and class two devices, there are no post-market surveillance requirements. And the FDA hasn't changed that policy. So you, you should be doing post-market surveillance, but you don't have to submit it. But that doesn't mean the FDA won't be looking at it when they do an inspection. So you will be expected to do post-market surveillance because it's part of ISO 1345. They didn't say they weren't including that, but they also didn't even mention post-market surveillance and not a single person in the entire world asked a question to the FDA about post-market surveillance, which just blows my mind that nobody thought this might be a major issue. Um, so I'm expecting there to be questions from the FDA, like where is your procedure for post-market surveillance? Where are your records of post-market surveillance? How are you summarizing that? And if you've got one that's compliant with European requirements, they're going to want to look at it. They're, they're actually going to say, where, where is this uh, that you've done for Europe? Why, why can't we see that too? <laughs> so don't think you're going to be able to hide it from them. Um, but at the same time, um, you may want, if you're not doing business in Europe, you might want to have something that's more along the lines of what would be expected for um, the ISO standard 20416 instead of specifically what the Europeans want. So that's a standard there, ISO 20416. I believe it's a 2020 or 2021 guy, uh, standard. So you might want to look at that for best practices on post-market surveillance. And then AAMI has a great guidance on 1345 that has a whole couple of pages on how to do that particular clause, 8.2.1. And um, I know I go really fast through all this and rattle this stuff off. You can always hit rewind and <laughs> watch it as many times as you want. It's free on YouTube. Um, so next item on the list. Okay, administrative details is the last section. So this is the stuff where you're going to indicate your registration information, your company address, different locations that you might have. Um, so that's the kind of stuff you're going to be putting in there. If you have ISO 1345 certification, you're going to put that there. Any um, previous decisions by um, regulators or um, certification bodies, that's what stuff goes there. So that's the information that you're going to be including in your medical device file. And it's always the current version. And as I said, the organization is as per this GHTF guidance. So if you don't want to use mine, if you don't want to pay for mine, all you have to do is go click on that link for that GHTF guidance document and create a table of contents index for yourself and then and have it be tabular format because the FDA loves that. And like, okay, this requirement is referencing this regulation in the G or this guidance item in the GHTF. This is the document where it can be found. This is the current revision. And this is the page or pages where the information is found. And that's how you build your medical device file. And you do it for each product family. So if you have a product family of, let's say, uh, sutures, if you're going to have a whole bunch of different lengths and sizes and gauges of sutures, but they're all the same material, you might put that in one family. And then you might have another family for a different type of suture, a different type of material. So depending on what your um, suture material is, you're, you're going to have different families of medical device files for those different types. So that's how you organize your medical device file. I am sure there will be questions. Um, so uh, <laughs> thank you for the very nice compliment, uh, uh, Alicia. I appreciate that. So I go through this stuff really, really fast. Keep in mind, the only way I do this, it's not because I have a memory that some that's supernatural or something. It's 25 years of doing this, 25 years of training on this, 25 years of creating the files in 20 different ways for different companies, different continents, different types of devices. That's how you get really, really good at this stuff. Um, but you, um, I have to look it up. So I actually have my cheat sheet over here. So it's not by memory. I'm remembering the different sections. It's, I have a cheat sheet right here that tells me, oh, administrative details is next. Um, and we teach this stuff in C marking. We teach this stuff for um, 1345. We teach it for US. And we want to tr we put some serious thought into what is the most efficient way so you do less work. So that's all it's about is trying to figure out how we can make this more efficient so you don't have to create, here's a DMR document, here's a tech file document, here's one for Canada, and here's one for another country. We want to be one document for all the countries. 
And that's the direction the FDA is trying to go here with this requirement is let's have a medical device file that's harmonized and global. That's the goal. And so the best practice is an index that covers all the countries. And so if you're doing Europe, have one that's lined up, aligned with the technical file requirements for Europe. If you're not doing anything in Europe, then have one that's aligned with the GHTF guidance. But the two are very, very close. And there's no reason why you can't do both. Okay. Have a great weekend. Um, any suggestions for next week's live um, streaming would be fantastic. And I'll see you then. Bye-bye.